So I've been umming and erring over a COVID update for a long time now, seeing as the situation has been chopping and changing from month to month, but recently things have sort of become a little bit clearer. Now I tend not to go into railway news all that much, seeing as that's what these guys are all for, but then I realised that about half of my audience are from overseas and they usually tend to turn to me for UK based heritage railway circumstances like these, for some reason, I'll never know why. Anyway, here's my recent evaluation of the current situation. I hope it doesn't all come across as opinionated bollocks, but only you can tell me if it does or not. So here goes. Alright, alright, this is looking more like it, isn't it? More than a quarter of the UK's population has been fully vaccinated, so it looks like we're finally beginning to turn the tide on this thing. And what better reflection could there be on this news than the sight of heritage railways gradually reopening in time for the busy summer season? Since the 12th of April, the Severn Valley, Swanage, North Norfolk and Eastley Lakeside Railways have been running trains, with the Ecclesbourne Valley, Linton and Barnstable, Kirklees, Dartmouth, MC and Bolton Abbey, Keithley and Great Central starting up over the rest of that week. Other railways began running trains in the weeks that followed, but the whole season hasn't quite reopened just yet partly because of government limitations surrounding catering, as most heritage lines make their living from selling food and indoor catering areas couldn't reopen until the 17th of May, partly because of limitations to the size of outdoor gatherings, but also due to a lack of financial certainty should restrictions change. Midland Railway Butterley is one such organisation that's erring on the side of caution, remaining shut until stage four of the national easing of lockdown restrictions, where, hopefully, everything will have been lifted. But as of the publication of this editorial, that won't be until the 21st of June at the very earliest, even later if this Indian variant manages to upset things. Looking back more than a year ago, when Heritage Railways stated they wouldn't run at all during the 2020 season, before revising their decision a few months later, it's a miracle we've come through as well as we have. Remember the time when people feared establishments like the Festiniog and North Yorkshire Moors Railways would cease to exist altogether? Brief and exaggerated it may have been for some, but that was a scary time for many people. Instead, the Little South Tyndale went into administration, but are now hoping to carry on from July 2021, and the only real casualty after that is one of the groups that was trying to build a new B-17, although seeing as most of it had been built from plywood and cardboard, I'm not entirely surprised. But even if railways recommence public running, their financial certainty doesn't necessarily remain straightforward. Let's not forget the Llangollen Railway infamously called in the receivers back in February. Now the reasons surrounding their financial woes go back a few years and are more to do with the engineering side of the business rather than the running of the railway itself. But nevertheless, losses from the Covid shutdown were pretty much the straw that broke the camel's back. Numerous assets, including some of the railway's operational coaching stock, went on the market. There was even talk of scrapping a heritage crane on site at one point. Now, the Thangotlin Railway Trust are slowly but surely putting a brave face on the situation, managing to secure most of these assets, but they're not out of the woods just yet. So if you can support the only standard gauge steam railway in North Wales, then please do. And that goes to every other heritage railway in the country. But, as touched on in the previous Covid update I did about a year ago, every railway needs different levels of support. Earlier this year, 63 heritage railway organisations received nearly £11 million combined in culture recovery funding, but that still leaves more than 100 private heritage lines and museums in England, Scotland, Wales, both parts of Ireland and the miscellaneous islands without such funding. Here's the thing, most of the big league heritage lines like the Bluebell, Great Central, North Yorkshire Moors, Severn Valley, etc. are more likely to be fine from here on in. They've got the support bases and financial connections to help them rise to challenges like these. But places that missed out on the culture recovery fund or don't have the same size of support bases are more likely to struggle. And I'm not talking about the Llangollen. Over in Ireland, heritage railways like the Cavan and Leitrim, Strad Valley and Waterford and Shore Valley don't really register on the same level of interest and priority as indoor museums. While local volunteers are able to catch up on maintenance, only the Waterford line is in a position to reopen from the 3rd of June. That being said, these railways demonstrate that smaller organisations mean lower overhead costs. Following layoffs after cancellation of its Santa season, the Kent and East Sussex Railway launched an appeal for £100,000 to help them through until their scheduled reopening on the 22nd of May, whereas Strad Bally's Save Our Steam appeal will help them recoup their losses from last year and most of this year without costing anywhere near that much. The Cavan and Leitrim had this to say about their current situation. We've had a tough 2020 and 2021. We never reopened for any period in 2020 and launched a fundraising campaign. We are hugely grateful to those who supported us. 
Unfortunately, in Ireland, many small organisations like ourselves cannot qualify for grant aid, so every penny meant so much. We have, however, managed to keep essential tasks going. In August and September, we managed to progress training for all volunteers and carry out Nancy's first annual boiler inspection at Drummond since returning to steam. We've also continued to relay our track, which also had to cease during lockdown around Christmas. Happily, the current guidelines allow us to continue this important work. We have two-thirds of the line fully relayed, with just another third to go. When complete, it will be a very well-laid line. Our progress on major capital projects has also continued apace, with Drummond and T&D Carriage 7T being restored. Museums have been allowed to reopen in Ireland, however, at the time of writing, it looks like we at the CNL will not reopen for the 2021 season, purely to protect our volunteers. We thank those for their support to date and encourage those who want to support us to check out our social media pages. We hope to have a very exciting 2022 on the horizon. Even if organisations receive funding, some of them still face unnecessary costs they could do without. The Avon Valley Railway received 97.4 grand in culture recovery funding, but was hit with a burglary on May the 8th when more than 30 grand's worth of irreplaceable tools and components were stolen. So even though they're set to reopen on the 22nd of May, they too could probably still do with donations to help balance out their books. Now I know some people may be thinking that a smaller organisation doesn't matter as much as a big one, but even the big boys had to start somewhere. For instance, back in 1981, a small group of volunteers moved into a desolate station area in the Cotswolds. It then took another three years for them to start running trains with a Hunslet saddle tank and barely 700 yards of track. Within 40 years of careful financing and running, the same place has now reopened 15 miles of track between two towns while hosting star-studded locomotives like Black Prince, City of Truro and King Edward II, running one of the biggest annual galas in the UK's Heritage Railway calendar and now carrying more than 130,000 passengers a year. All this from starting with less than the Spa Valley had to start with. At least they had an engine shed. Now sure enough, we may have passed the age where establishments like the Whitwell and Reefham could gradually evolve into something as big as the Gloucestershire and Warwickshire as it is today over that same time, but the point is, just because a heritage line doesn't have the longest length of track, doesn't make the most money, or doesn't run outside weekends between April and September, doesn't mean it automatically sucks. It could be fun to volunteer at, not be swamped by tons of health and safety legislation slowing down the opportunities for people to climb the ladder on the footplate or any other crew pecking order. It could be more quaint, less commercialised, more laid back, and just as important to history in its own way. Or, dare I say it, a smaller railway may not have the same problems and accusations of hierarchy that some of the bigger railways might have in the eyes of some people. I'll leave a link in the description for every heritage railway I've mentioned in this editorial, so if you still have a few pennies to spare and you'd like to see your local heritage organisation through to the end of this horrible, horrible time, then please do consider giving what you can. Some of them may be running again, but they'll still have lost ground to cover. We're all in this together, and if 2020 is anything to go by, a simple plug of this appeal or that fundraiser can make all the difference. As for me, I haven't caught this horrible, disgusting bat plague just yet, but I don't intend to. Keep safe, everybody. I'm Chris, and I'm here to gauge the issue. Alaska.